Who likes to go to the beach? Yeah, who's been to the beach already this summer? Okay. Now, one of my favorite things to do on the beach, and this may be a little bit seem a little maybe seem a little bit young, but I love the boogie board. Who likes the boogie board? Yeah. No? Okay. Do you know what it is? Yeah, the body surfing, right? So we, we're in Orlando, uh, courtesy of our good friend Bill, and we went to Cocoa Beach, and on the way there we stopped at this little wave shop, and they had plenty of, you know, paraphernalia that we could purchase. We bought a few boogie boards, too, and um, one of my favorite things is to get out of the ocean with my kids, and, you know, you gotta got to get past the first um, layer of waves, you get into the second layer, and you got to watch for a certain kind of wave. This is just my, my way, my philosophy. Um, I call it a rebreaker. Rebreaker. So you get a wave that's coming and it breaks early. You know what I'm talking about? It rises up and breaks early, and that's an indication that's a deeper wave. And when it hits the shore and it comes back for that second break, it's going to be ready to potentially carry you all the way to the shore. Because the thing is with a, with a boogie board, in order to have a good time, the trick is positioning yourself well so that what? Exactly. You position yourself well so that the wave actually will carry you all the way in. Now, if you're just trying to paddle in yourself, is that going to take a little while? Yeah. Absolutely. But if you position yourself just right, you've got to be patient. You, know, you see that rebreaker coming, it's broken already, it's starting to pick up, and at just the right moment, you position yourself and get in the way, and then it carries you all the way in. So if you position yourself just right, all you have to do is hold on, because you could get flipped, it's strong, and enjoy the ride. Now, can you remember a time in your life when you just happened to be at the right place at the right time? Remember a time like that? Just You're just at the right place at the right time. You can't even begin to take credit for what happened. In moments like this, we say something like this. We say, I couldn't have planned it any better. You know, not to mention the fact that you couldn't have caused it to happen. It just happened. Right place right time. And I believe it's similar in our spiritual life. If we will allow God to place us in the proper position, a position where we're humble, a position where we're dependent on Him, then we're going to get to experience His power in His timing. We'll get to experience God things. You ever have one of those? Something happens, circumstances arrange, the stars align, and you just think, man, that was a God. Thing. I couldn't have made that happen if I tried. I could not have arranged it better. In fact, if we're positioned just right, there will come a time when all we have to do is just hold on and enjoy the ride because God is at work and God is up to something and we're just along for the ride. Today we're going to talk about a man who did not forget the life lessons taught to him by both his mentor and his God. And because he chose to remain both humble and Independent. He got to see God display his power in a way that is still talked about to this day. And in fact, they've written songs about it. Now, the first time that we see Joshua mentioned in the Bible is in a battle in Exodus 17, where God defeats the Amalekites. You may be familiar with the story. What's interesting about the battle is that Moses' physical position was critical to the victory. <clears throat> so Moses was up on the side of a mountain. Joshua's leading the troops down below, and God kind of decrees that Moses has to hold his hands up in the air. And so what he's doing is it's symbolic that God is the one who's fighting the battle. God is the one who's going to earn the victory, and Joshua just has to keep his hands up. Well, he has to do that all day long. You think his hands are going to get tired? You imagine that? How tired your arms would get? You imagine that, Caleb, holding your arms up all day long? So he eventually has to sit on a stone, and he gets his assistants to hold his arms up because when his arms start to go down, the Israelites start losing. But when his arms stay up, the Israelites are winning, and eventually they are victorious. And so I believe this is a lesson that Joshua never forgot. And, what, and the lesson was this, is that victory comes from the Lord when the victor is dependent on the Lord. Victory comes from the Lord when the victor is dependent on the Lord. And I think Joshua never forgot that. And so after wandering in the, de the desert for 40 years because of their disobedience, now Israel's finally allowed to enter the promised land. And so this is how our narrative begins today in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. And the first point today is that God is the one who positions Israel for victory. God positions Israel for victory. 
After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you, and I will not abandon you. Now Joshua has waited a long time for this day. He was with them for 40 years in the wilderness. In fact, biblical historians estimate he's about 96 at this time. Can you imagine that? Joshua, the military commander, 96 years old. And his experiences with God have taught him two important lessons. The first is that God does things in his time, not man's time, right? The Israelites disobeyed. They had to pay the price. They had to wait 40 years to the time he was 96. So God does things in his time, not man's time. But when God is ready, when God is ready to move, when God is ready to act, all Joshua has to do is to hold it steady. When God is ready, we just have to hold it steady. So likely a young man of 40 at the time of the Exodus, he saw clearly what Moses' role was when God was ready to move. Because it was 400 years before God was ready to take the Israelites out of Egypt. But when God was ready to move, Moses had one job, and that was to just hold it together. He was a bit of a mess, and to be faithful to his calling. And he just had to hold on, and he was along for the ride. In addition to the word of the Lord we've just read, God also confirmed that the time was right to attack Jericho from the mouth of one of the residents of that city. Turn to Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. We see the, the story is building and growing. Verse 8, before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. So these guys had gone into town. They'd been sent in to spy out the land. They had found lodging at a, a house of ill repute. Look that up. You'll know what it means. And so they're there, and they're afraid, and they're terrified, and they feel small. I mean, they're in the enemy camp, and they're expecting that the enemy is preparing for battle. And then they're shocked and surprised to hear this message from the mouth of Rahab. She told them, I know the Lord has given you this land. I mean, they're in enemy territory. This is a surprising message. I know the Lord has given you this land. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og and to Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight, to even fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. So what a surprising, encouraging message that God has gone ahead of them. He has prepared the way. Now is the time. This is reminiscent of the time when God told Gideon to attack the Midianites. Remember that story? They had 300 men against possibly a million. And God gave their little band of 300 Courage by directing them to sneak into the Midianite camp and eavesdrop on the soldiers. And the soldiers were saying something very similar. And after hearing the fear, Gideon did not hesitate. So after hearing this message, Joshua and his men were very much encouraged. But there was another order of business they needed to take care of. After calling Joshua and confirming their upcoming victory, God did something which was also necessary for the Israelites follow Moses, and he had to do this for Joshua. And it's number two, that God exalts Joshua above his peers. God exalts Joshua above his peers. Chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. So these people, I mean, they're not going to follow Joshua in the battle unless they receive confirmation that he's God's man. Moses had to do multiple miracles to convince the Israelites to follow him. And so God's about to do something special through Joshua. He said, give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. And what happens next is amazing. 
I mean, it's, it's the Jordan River. It's flood time. This could be a fatal choice. But he says, step into the water with the Ark of the Covenant, and then the waters part. The waters are pulled back, and they're able to walk through on dry ground. So God does something miraculous and unmistakable to show that Joshua is, in fact, his chosen leader. And it's at this point that Joshua, I think, faces the challenge that every called leader encounters. In fact, when the monarchy or the, or the kings begin with David, this is an area that virtually every Israelite king faltered in at some point. When a leader is clearly chosen and called by God, it is difficult for them to remain humble and say, this is about God, not me. And it's difficult for them to remain dependent. The temptation is for them to become independent and say, I'm the king. I've got the power. This is all about me. I'm chosen by God. I'm the man. So let me share two examples from the life of Joshua. And in this particular story, to illustrate how Joshua responded to this pressure. Because now he's been exalted. Right? Joshua's been raised above his peers. Israel's position for victory. Joshua's raised above his peers. But now the real test happens for him. He needs to remain dependent. And he needs to remain humble. Joshua chapter 5 verse 1. When all the Amorite kings of the west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings who lived along the Mediterranean coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan River so the people of Israel could cross, they lost heart and were paralyzed with fear because of it. So again, we see God preparing the way. And at that time, the Lord told Joshua something that sounds crazy. I mean, they're in enemy territory. They're about to go into battle and watch what God commands him to do. It says, make flint knives and circumcise the second generation of Israelites. This is something that has not yet happened. This is the people that are left over after the people died in the desert. And they have not yet been circumcised. It's a sign of the covenant or the relationship between them and God. They have not yet been set apart. And he could not have picked a worse time, right? They're in enemy territory. You know what's going to happen when they perform this little surgery? And they didn't do it shifts. All at the same time is for several days, they're going to be completely helpless. I mean, if the enemy attacks during that time, they're toast. So why is God doing this? God commands them to circumcise. So Joshua responds. Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the entire male population of Israel at Gibeah, Haraloth. And if Jack was here, I'd have him read. On the eve of battle, God chooses to make Joshua and his men vulnerable. And here's why. I believe. Here's why. He made them vulnerable in order to address the fatal flaw that caused their forefathers to wander in the desert. For 40 years is punishment. It's unbelief. I mean, throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament, it's the disobedience that's the trigger for judgment. But what's underneath is unbelief. What's underneath is unbelief. And that's the fatal flaw that God's addressing. God is going to set up a situation, a scenario where they're helpless, where they have to depend completely on him. And indeed they do. So two things were accomplished through this courageous act. They identified clearly as God's people, distinct from the other nations. They were circumcised. And they learned that God is trustworthy. And he can protect them even when they make themselves completely vulnerable. Because up to this point, I mean... God is moving, God is working, but they've still got their weapons, right? Men, yeah, still got their guns, still got their knives, still got their swords. I mean, God is working, but they can still defend themselves, and now they can't. And they have to depend completely on the Lord. And after this, so Joshua shows that he's dependent, right? Passes the first test. He's remained dependent. God says do it, he does it. He puts himself and his whole army, the lives of all of his men on the line, and in dependence on God. But now he has to pass what could be the tougher test. Will he remain humble? Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, because Joshua's the boss, right? Demanded, are you friend or foe? You can see Joshua, he's got a sword. He's saying, if it's a foe, I have authority. I have, I have the right and the responsibility to dispatch this enemy. And the gentleman says, neither one. I am the commander of the war's army. Now he's speaking to the commander of God's people, right? Joshua. 
But he identifies himself and says, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Now Joshua has a choice. How is he going to respond? Is he going to respond with humility or is he going to respond with arrogance? Hey, I'm in charge. I don't care who you say you are. But look at his response. Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. And this is reminiscent of Moses. Remember so many times in the life of Moses, Joshua's leader, he would come up against insurmountable odds and Moses would always fall on his face. He would never defend himself. He would fall on his face and humble himself before the Lord and then cry out to God. And Joshua does exactly the same. He falls to the ground in reverence and says, I am at your command. What do you want your servant to do? And this to me confirms that this was a test. The commander of the Lord's army has nothing specific for him to do other than take off your sandals from the place where you are standing So it's as if God wants to make sure on the eve of battle, before he raises Joshua to prominence, he wants to make sure that Joshua's not only dependent, because he's following orders, he gets it. I mean, God says, I do, we win. I mean, that works. But God wants to make sure, not only is he dependent, but humble. That his elevated position, that he recognizes that it depends completely on God's calling. That this is important for him to understand. And then lastly, God displays his power. God displays his power through his people because it's all been building to this. God positioned Israel for victory. God exalted Joshua above his peers in preparation and then Joshua passes the test. He remains dependent. He remains humble. And now it's time for God to display his power through his people, because as we've said all through this message, it's all about being in the right position, right? We talked about it at the beginning. It's about catching the wave. It's about being positioned well, and then God's power is available. When God's ready, when it's his time, when it's his will, he's going to move, and all we have to do is just get in the flow and go along for the ride. And now it's about to happen in a dramatic way. Chapter 6, verse 16. The seventh time around, because you know they've, they've been walking around the city, and, the, and you know the, the people in Jericho are thinking, what, what, what's wrong with these people? They're, they're a little bit crazy. I mean, they're not attacking us. They're just walking around the city again and again and again. Well, the seventh time they walk around, the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, and Joshua commanded the people. He said, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. And then go on to verse 20. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed, and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. So Israel was positioned by God. Joshua was positioned by God. And when Joshua remained humble and dependent, they got to see God do something incredible. He tore down the walls. He did something miraculous. He did something that was unmistakable. Nobody could claim that it was Israel. Nobody could claim that it was Joshua. It was clearly the Lord God who had won the battle that day. And so because they, the victor was dependent on God, and victory came from the Lord. And then verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his reputation spread throughout the land. I think it's intentional. It doesn't, it doesn't distinguish whether it was Joshua's reputation or whether it was the Lord's reputation. But do you see in the life of Joshua, the lesson for you and I today is that God has a calling on your life. God has a calling on my life, and it may not happen immediately. Joshua was 96. He had to wait a long time. So I don't know where this hits you today. Maybe there's something you're waiting on. Maybe there's something you're hoping to see happen. And you know that God is capable. You know it. You believe it. You've read it. But you're still waiting. And it's frustrating. And it's like, God, when are you going to do it? When are you going to unleash that power that I know that you have? When are you going to do that thing that I've been praying for you to do? And your job and my job is to be like Joshua. Remain humble. You know? Remain dependent. Remain faithful to that calling that God's put on your life. And there will come a time. There will come a time for you. There will come a time for you when God is ready to move. It might all just be preparation. He'll be ready to move. And if we're humble and if we're dependent, then we're going to be ready. We're going to be well 
position to go along for the ride and to see God unleash his power. But this, the frustrating part is it's his timing, not mine, right? It's his timing, not yours. And there's nothing that you and I can do to force his hand. Frustrating, isn't it? But as a good God, as an almighty God, as a loving Father, his message for you and for me today then would be, be patient. I love you. I have good plans. I'm going to execute them. I have the power. I mean, this story leaves no doubt. But it's his timing. And if we're humble and dependent, then he will display his power will. Yesterday there was a community impact day. I've been, I'm part of a nonprofit called Hope and Road, trying to boost homeownership in Walton County. And it's been a long time coming. It's been six, eight months. We've been planning. We've been meeting. And it feels like we're not making much progress. Well, yesterday we had our community impact day. And it was extremely well attended. A lot of people from the community from different backgrounds of different colors came together to be educated. They want it better themselves. They want to improve their lives and address a great need in our community. And there were so many volunteers there present, and it was all coming together. But it took many, many meetings, many, many days of kind of laboring in the dark, laboring without seeing results. But when God was ready, there was a whole bunch of people who were humble. There was a whole bunch of people who were dependent and waiting on the Lord, and then he showed up in his time. And we just got to enjoy an exciting event to see that God is moving in our community. So the bottom line today for you and for me is that God displays his power. He does. We don't always see it. It's not always in our time, but God displays his power, but it's through well-positioned people, people who are humble. They're not looking for the credit. And people who are dependent, they're willing to obey, they're willing to wait, they're willing to be faithful to God. So what about you today? Have you allowed God to position you for victory in your life? Are you humble, looking to give him the credit? How do you respond to success? Who gets the credit in your life? I mean, through both good times and bad, because we have them both, are you willing to stay humble, to stay dependent on the Lord? I mean, what if you and I would allow God to position us? I mean, he's just waiting for you. He's just waiting for me to be willing to allow him to position us for impact. He's got good plans. He's got a calling on your life. So what if we allowed God to position us? Not my will, God, but your will. What if we were careful to give God all the credit? When things go right, when things go well, we don't take the credit. We just give glory to God. Humble. Keep us dependent. I mean, what could God accomplish through a band of believers like this? Well positioned, devoted to His will, careful to give Him credit, humble and dependent. I suspect that we would be well positioned for God to display His power in a way that is unmistakable. Yesterday it was clear. I mean, nobody was there for themselves, they were there to honor God and bless their neighbors will be well positioned for God to display his power in a way that's unmistakable for people to say God is up to something. So what about you? Are you willing to allow God? Are you willing to trust God as the Israelites did and put yourself in a vulnerable place? Be humble. Be dependent. Be patient so that when God is ready to move in your life, when he's ready to move in my life, we'll be ready to hang on, to keep it steady, to hold on and enjoy God, thank you so much for today and this chance to be together with my friends. Thank you for the scripture and the message that it has for us, God. That Joshua was exactly where you placed him. And the only qualifications, the only qualifications, God, that you're looking for from us is not ability. It's not skill. It's just willingness, God, to be humble. Willingness, God, to be dependent, to stick to it, to hold on, to hold it together long enough to see you do the things that only you can do, God, because our world needs to see your power. Our world is struggling. We're struggling, and we need to see your power. We need to see that you're able. We need to see that you're capable, and we know that your plan is, as it was in this story, to do it through, in and through your well-positioned people. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.